What if I were to tell you that before top speed headliners like the Koenigsegg CCXR and the Hennessy Venom GT, and even before the McLaren F1, there was already a street legal road car that exceeded the 250 mile per hour barrier? What if I told you it broke that record way back in 1988 and held it for nearly two decades? nineteen eighty four marked the introduction year of the C4 Corvette. Though the chassis itself was rather state of the art, being a unibody for the first time instead of body on a frame, the C4 initially was released with the carryover engine from the C3 Corvette. This was an L83 350 small block making only 205 horsepower and 290 foot pounds of torque. The following year in 1985, the C4 would then be equipped with the GM's newly introduced 5.7 L98 not to be confused with GM 6 liter L98 used in holding vehicles in the mid 2000s. This was a then modern take on a 350 small block featuring two port injection. The updated V8 would also feature a ram air intake system with the mouth of the intake terminating well past the radiator away from engine heat. Additionally, with the 0.5 bump in compression, the L98 was a considerable upgrade over the L83 making 230 horsepower and 330 foot pounds of torque. This output was still lacking compared to the other flagships on the road stage and this was apparent to no one more than Dave McLean and his Corvette development team. In fact, there had been various other smaller displacement turbo cars that completely outpowered the 5.7 C4. Knowing that that customer would only want a V8, it then occurred to the development team why not just build a turbo V8. The problem was GM did not have the means at the time, especially in an industry still being suffocated by the emissions regulations of the 1970s oil crisis. It was then that Chief Engineer Dave McLean began to recall a particular shop out of Connecticut that was highly renowned and experienced in building turbocharged BMWs, Alfa Romeos, and Volkswagens. This was Callaway Cars. It was their twin turbo Alfa Romeo GTV6 that really piqued the interest of GM, which in fact offered comparable performance to the C4 at the time, but we'll get into those details in just a moment. The Corvette team wanted a similar twin turbo treatment for the C4's 5.7 liter V8. It was at this time that Dave McLean decided to phone the man in charge of the shop in Connecticut. Reeves Calloway was a self-taught legend in the making that aspired to become a professional race car driver. In 1973, he won the SCCA Formula V Championship and shortly after became an instructor at the renowned Bob Bondurant School of High Performance Driving. After some time, however, he shifted his focus from pursuing a racing career to professionally modifying cars with his first product being a turbo kit for the E21 320i. Soon after, a car and driver journalist would review the custom E21 and the publicity generated enough interest for Reeves to launch Callaway as we know it. So yes, we did hand a car over to Don Sherman, the car and driver, and he wrote a little one-pager in the back of the book 
in 1977 that made it sound like Callaway was a, a company, not not a garage, that was ready to supply the world with turbocharger kits. Wow. Well, Stephen, the, the, the truth was we didn't have a drill press. But when the orders started to roll in, we found a way to make all that stuff and make it fast and make it well. Don's article launched Callaway Turbo Systems. This would essentially be the equivalent of going viral in 1977 within the performance automotive industry. He soon began offering performance kits for other vehicles while continuously building up his shop in Old Lyme, Connecticut. It was then he began attracting the attention of actual manufacturers. Alfa Romeo was his first big break, as Callaway was commissioned to develop a turbo package for the GTV6 that debuted in 1983. Alfa was looking to make the GTV6 their halo vehicle in the US and more competitive against Maserati's Biturbo, and what better way to do that than offer their own Biturbo package. This was a dream come true for Callaway, and it rocketed him beyond the status of just an average tuning garage. Named the Callaway C3, this version of the GTV6 offered a whopping 50% power increase over the standard model, yielding 230 horsepower and 245 foot-pounds of torque. To put that into perspective, being a car with a sub 6 second 0 to 60, it would have given the new 1984 Corvette a run for its money. Unfortunately, only 36 of these Callaway GTV6s were ever produced, and by 1985, the joint venture ended just as fast as it had started. Alfa Romeo decided to begin pulling out of the US market, and the last Callaway GTV6 would be a 1985 model, sold as a 1986. The connection Callaway cars needed was over. And then, just in time, Reeves Callaway received a phone call. It was the Corvette chief engineer, Dave McLeland of General Motors. In 1985, being thoroughly impressed with Callaway's engineering abilities after evaluating the GTV6, the ranks at GM saw the company as a prime candidate for developing the high-performance powertrain option for the Corvette. Dave McLeland would call Callaway giving him the green light, authorizing the development of a prototype twin-turbo Corvette. For Callaway, this couldn't have come at a better time, and it's likely that neither party realized that this would be the catalyst for a world record. By fall of 1986, the Callaway team had built the initial prototype, multiple prototypes supposedly. Interestingly enough, it's alleged their biggest hurdle was getting the L98 engine to pass the same durability testing standards as the Callaway C3 Alpha did. The Callaway team modified the L98 bottom up, receiving modified 4 bolt main caps, a forged crank, upgraded rods, and lower 7.5 to 1 compression ratio pistons supplied by Mayhill or Cosworth. The heads received intake valves and springs, furthering the overall durability. Once the block and head work was completed, dual water-cooled Rotomaster T04 turbos were mounted with twin intercoolers. These would line up directly with the dual air intake scoops on the iconic Callaway hood, feeding fresh cold air. Finally, the team would install a larger radiator, modified exhaust, and fuel system to feed the Thirsty Boosted V8, making 345 horsepower and 465 foot-pounds of torque. Over 100 horsepower and torque over stock. The 0 to 60 was now under 5 seconds, while the top speed was over 170. With Callaway's Alfa Romeo being the C3, the Callaway Vet would ironically be the C4, or known internally as the B2K option. With McLeland and GM's expectations completely met if not exceeded, the next year in 1987, the B2K option would be an RPO, or regular production option, orderable from select dealers in the United States. For the first time in history, this would be a factory orderable non-GM installed performance trim. Not only could you order it directly from a dealer, it still came with a Chevrolet factory warranty with Callaway covering the powertrain for 12,000 miles, or 12 months. This was all for $20,000 over factory Corvette's 1987 cost, granting you the ability to got 930 turbos in a car that was around $60,000. Even with the successful debut of the B2K package, Reeves and his team were setting their sights even higher. The Callaway team had a research and development project underway called the Top Gun. They were using this platform to study turbocharging, cooling, and aerodynamics at an even higher end of the performance spectrum. 
While this project had already been ongoing in July 1987, Road and Track magazine published their annual World's Fastest Car issue, consisting of 80s German and Italian dream machines. That year, the roof CTR Yellowbird would dominate the entire field with a top speed of 211 miles per hour. Soon after, rival magazine Car and Driver made a call out to find the fastest road legal car in North America. This would be the infamous Gathering of the Eagles. Car and Driver would promise a bit of fame along with the chance to run flat out in one of the best equipped facilities in the world. And I quote, Come join us at the Transportation Research Center of Ohio. We'll run your car against the clocks at TRC's 7.5 mile oval. Oh, and don't bother showing up unless your car is capable of at least 175 miles per hour. Emotional, damn it! While there were a number of tuners that declined, like Aloise Roof, Gail Banks, and Willie Koenig, to name a few, there were five individuals that took on the challenge. Reese Calloway was one of them. Not only would he be competing with the B2K Twin Turbo Corvette, he would also be bringing his Top Gun R&D project to the competition. Each car would circle the oval first in one direction, hitting the speed trap, and then in the opposite direction through the other speed trap. The traps were accurate up to 0.1 miles per hour. The two speeds would be then averaged to produce the car's official top end. Among the seven cars was an AMG Hammer, a mildly tuned Callaway C4, a stock Ferrari Testarossa, and the 8.9 liter Keef Black Camaro. There was also a Motorsport Design 911 Turbo with ported heads, custom turbos, intake and fueling. Then there's the Norwood Ferrari 308 GTO, with a 5-liter Can-Am spec Chevy small block swap, and finally, the Callaway Top Gun Corvette. The Top Gun would feature a 355 cubic inch small block, Brodex aluminum heads with two Ray J E10 turbos at 10 PSI, and dual intercoolers. Though the max output is reported to be around 900 to 1000 horsepower, the Top Gun was only dialed at 712. This was mainly due to it still utilizing the stock 4-speed trans in overdrive which was at its limit. The build featured one aero modification and that was the extended front air down. It also featured 200 pounds of rear ballast, a roll cage, and harness. Reeves would pilot the first run himself and the second run would be driven by Rich Seppos, C&D driver and journalist who would write the 1987 Gathering of Eagles article. Reeves himself clocked 214 miles per hour on the first initial run. Then Seppos would clock 231 miles per hour, bringing the Top Gun's average to a whopping 222.4 miles per hour. This was the fastest speed recorder of the entire competition, with the Keith Black Camaro clocking 216 and the Motorsport Design Turbo clocking 202.5 miles per hour. Seppos related the experience to it being his own personal Mount Everest, stating he'd treasure the memory forever. Though the Top Gun was king, it did have its flaws. The Callaway team didn't have time to calibrate the fuel delivery below 4000 RPM, and the car shuddered during low engine speeds. It was fouling plugs, there was no AC, and then there was the factory gearbox dilemma. Reeves Calloway, however, had already taken all this into consideration and contemplated his next move after his major historical success. After the completion of the run, Reeves was quoted by Seppo stating, I think I could duplicate this car for $150,000 or $160,000. I figure there must be five or six people in this country who might want a car like this. And this is how Top Gun became the precursor to the fastest street car in the world, the Callaway Sledgehammer. Reeves Callaway was not a man known to settle. Even with the B2K C4 packages selling and Top Gun making history, he had his mind set on an even more extraordinary goal. Dubbed Project Sledgehammer, this will be Callaway's all-out effort to crush his own record and prove to Europe's best and the world that a street-legal Corvette could attain and hold the title as the fastest car in the world. The Callaway team and technical advisor NHRA legend John Ligenfelter would start with a fresh B2K rebuilding the blueprint at Boltside 5.7 with splayed 4-bolt main caps. Instead of just having 2-bolt main caps securing the crankshaft, it now has 4 bolts, 2 being vertical and 2 lateral, increasing lateral stability. The block was then mated with a Cosworth crankshaft, forged rods and forged Mayhill pistons, 
and a mild custom cam was used to retain near stock drivability and normal commuting conditions. The engine would also utilize a dry sump lubrication system, MST ignition, Zytec ECU, and Brodex aluminum cylinder heads. The final touch for the engine would be the twin Turbonetics TO4B turbos that would be matched with the same massive front mount dual intercoolers used in the Top Gun. No emissions controls would be in place, with stainless steel headers flowing directly to quad exit mufflers. Being that the Top Gun was only held back by its stock Corvette 4-speed, the sledgehammer was equipped with the Doug Nash 5-speed auto. It did not use the ZF 6-speed that was made available later on. So what did the new sledgehammer yield? A screaming 900 horsepower, and 772 foot-pounds of torque at 22 psi. Remember, this was the 80s, so for an otherwise normal street car, this output was insane. Even more impressive was the fact it was so fine-tuned that it drove like a normal C4. No shuddering and excessive heat like the Top Gun at the Eagles competition. In fact, it was so refined, even the chassis were taken to the next level. It featured GM's new FX3 suspension tech or a selective ride control adjustable dampening. Carol Smith, another racing legend, would provide some expertise, tuning the suspension, adding custom springs, and relocating the lower control arms. Next, the Callaway team would have the accomplished Canadian designer and engineer, Paul Deutschman, develop the sledgehammer's bodywork. This would eventually evolve into what is known as the Callaway Aero Body. Quoting Street Muscle Magazine, The Aero Kit includes specific front and rear fascias, hood, and rockers. Everything was slotted and vented to reduce drag, limit lift, and increase cooling airflow. Even the surround of the snout-mounted Corvette emblem allows air to flow in the engine bay. Reeves wanted this to be a supercar capable of daily driving, so it retained its AC, sound system, leather seats, and all other power options. It featured a leather wrap half cage and five-point harness for additional safety but otherwise retained the production car mantra. The sledgehammer was a complete evolution of the Top Gun, and the team had accomplished this within a year. It was now time for Reeves to live up to his own expectations and show that the car was not only faster on paper, but on the track. Reeves and the Callaway team would be heading back to the Transportation Research Center in Liberty, Ohio, less than a year after the flight of the Eagles. But this time, to prove how production-worthy and refined the sledgehammer was, he without incident drove the car 700 miles to the track from Connecticut to Ohio. On October 26, 1988, the team arrived at TRC. The crew went over their normal checks as any professional racing or engineering team would do. There were two issues that would require resolving, one being misfires caused by gummed up injectors, and the second being an oil leak. These were swiftly resolved and the team began conducting test runs. Despite there being very few people outside the Callaway team that believed the sledgehammer could go any faster, the test driver, John Ligenfilter, would completely invalidate their assumptions. Ligenfilter trapped 248 miles per hour on the first one that was noted as not being 100% flat out. Then during the second run, the sledgehammer reached 254.76 miles per hour. This would completely dominate all competition at that time in history. After decimating the world record, Reeves Calloway stated, we really did look at it as a private test session to make sure that when the opportunity comes to do some head-to-head -head competition, we would have our act together. And I think it's ready for anybody who wants to take the challenge. And nobody would take that challenge, at least not in the production or street legal category. It seems that the annual top speed competitions that magazines like Road and Track and Car and Driver would host all ended after 1988. I mean, if you couldn't beat the sledgehammer, what was the point? Even the McLaren F1 would only trap 243 miles per hour five years later in 1993. In fact, it seems no streetable or production car would actually beat the Callaway sledgehammer for a full 18 years. September 13, 2007, the Shelby Supercars Ultimate Aero TT, no relation to Carroll Shelby, yielded a staggering production car speed record of 255.83 miles per hour. This was GPS verified and met the full requirements of the Guinness Book of World Records. While others credit the Veyron SS for breaking the Callaway's record, my research points to the ultimate arrow. It actually managed 257.11 miles per hour, but the Guinness Book of World Records required you to quote, drive down the course, turn around, 
and make a second pass in the opposite direction within one hour. The vehicle's top speed is the calculated average of those two speeds. Pretty reminiscent of CND's gathering of the Eagles requirements. Another note is that the Sledgehammer was never considered a standalone production vehicle or a production trim. For example, the Callaway C4 variants don't have proprietary VIN numbers, meaning their VIN would simply identify them as an L98 Corvette they started life as. This was my educated guess, but I wanted to confirm for you guys, especially in reference to the Top Gun and the Sledgehammer. So what I did was I reached out to Callaway directly. By the way, they responded within 30 minutes. Awesome. Thank you for your interest in Callaway cars. The vehicles you referred to displayed standard bins, but neither was a production car. The Sledgehammer was, however, constructed to be street legal and was driven to and from Ohio and Connecticut before and after the performance tests. And that pretty much confirms it. But this doesn't take away at all from the incredible accomplishment and history of Callaway cars and the Sledgehammer. Let's be real, if you wanted a 250 mile per hour street car in the early 90s, having Reeves Callaway build you a C4 similar to the Sledgehammer was way more attainable than a McLaren F1. Finally, as I write this script in mid-July 2024, Mr. Reeves Callaway passed away almost exactly one year ago on the 13th of July 2023. I hope this documentary puts into perspective how legendary and forward-thinking Reeves Callaway was and the incredible legacy he leaves behind. He was a self-taught man that went from developing turbo kits to constructing and homologating C6 and C7 GT3 race cars and so much more. The Callaway organization continues to grow carrying the torch lit by Mr. Callaway. It has been an honor to share his story. Thank you all again for watching. I appreciate it more than I can express in words. Until next time.